Hello and welcome to our monthly podcast. Uh, we are the team of the Health Shift Project and with me today I have Dr. Amanda, who is a naturopath and stress expert. And I have Shelly here, who is our yoga instructor extraordinaire. <laughs> And myself, Carrie, I am a holistic nutritionist and lover of holistic living. So our topic for the month of November is finding balance as we care for and support others. And I'm wondering, as you're caring and supporting for others, do you feel grounded in your own self? Or do you feel overwhelmed by it and consumed by their needs and feeling guilt, which is resulting in high levels of stress and discomfort in your body? So if the latter is the case, then you're going to want to tap in and listen to this podcast and hear what we have to say. And we hope that we will share some, you know, maybe some new insights and tips and tricks for you that will help. And we thought we would stop by, start by sharing an analogy. Are you familiar with that analogy of putting the uh, oxygen mask on yourself first? So, you know, when you're on an airplane and, and they do say, you know, if, if you're needing to use the oxygen mask, that you put it on yourself first before assisting others. And that's what it's like with, with stress and, and being in this state of, of overwhelm, that in order to be there for others, we have to first take care of ourselves, you know, get ourselves in check, put that oxygen mask on ourselves, and then care for others. So we're going to share a lot more about that kind of uh, talk today. And uh, in the Health Shift Project, their membership site, Dr. Amanda shared a really beautiful article. I really enjoyed the article, by the way, Amanda. And uh, there were some really good tidbits in there, and I could really resonate with a lot of it, what you were saying. And if you don't mind, the, the topic was empathy versus compassion. And Amanda, I was wondering if you would share maybe a little bit more about that. Sure. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, um, I was prompted to write this because I'm always trying to look at how to get to really a root area where we can make shifts in what the place I like to work on the most is the mindset. Our daily practices and how we interact with others and all of that are obviously so important, but underneath those things, the habits we create, the way we interact, the way we manage our lives are all based on the mindset and the, the, the sort of psychological setup that we have in how we view stress, how we view events in our lives, all those things. So I'm always trying to dig under and try to find ways to shift those things to make them healthier and make it easier. Because I think that a lot of the self-help that I've read and worked with is very much about more discipline, more work, harder, you know, if, if you just stick to things better, and if you just work harder at letting go or doing these things that you that things will get better. And I think that can bring on a lot of guilt for people and a lot of, um, and, and just feeling like, oh, I just can't quite do it. So I'm always trying to look in that little deeper way of like, how can I shift how I look at it? so that my work in my life and everything that I do either for my own health or for others becomes easier. And so I wanted to look at the idea of being an empathetic person, which so many of us are. So many people, um, especially so many women and men though that, that I know, just so naturally and easily feel the pain of others. We hear stories, we can even see a commercial and be in tears pretty easily. We, we experience um, something that another person has gone through and empathy is really having the physiological experience that it's happening to us as well in the same moment that we can, that we can empathize, that we can see exactly what that person is going through and that we ourselves have the same feelings of anger, of loss, of whatever. So we really are able to understand what another person is going through. And that's often looked at as a first step. Like you have to be able to, 
to really appreciate somebody else's situation or their their plight or um, where they're at in order to know how to help them. But my article and what I was talking about is that what can happen with, with that empathetic position that we take is that we then use our own imaginations as to what would be best for that person or what that person needs based on what we perceive to be their problem. So if someone has had a major loss or if someone has um, been diagnosed with an illness, we might imagine what that would be like in our lives. What would it be like if we lost our someone we loved and how would we feel and how would that um, play out in our lives? And that I think that can be good, but it can also lead us down a path of um, assuming or presuming things that may not be true for that other person. And it can stop us from actually really listening and really hearing what is going on for that other person as we're trying to help them. Or we may jump to conclusions that they need certain things and start diving in and doing certain things when that may not be the case. And so the other term that I describe in the article and talk about is compassion, that it is also a state that we get into where we can experience someone else's situation where where we see that there is a need and that there's suffering going on but we stop ourselves from that that extrapolating or that imagining what it is they need then how how are we supposed to help them and we stay a little bit more in the place of of appreciating that they're suffering and the term that always sits with me as i remember it is being with them it is such a powerful thing to sit with someone and to allow them whatever space they need to grieve or to yell or to do whatever and to not judge that that reaction and to just be with someone in their suffering and in their time of need. I also think about this in terms of like for me, most of my world is centered around taking care of children. And um, I can, you know, sometimes I'm really, really on in, in the moment realizing that one of my kids is experiencing something or I may think about to experience something and I try to rush in and like maybe try and fix the situation so they won't experience any pain or I can like, I can prevent them from going through something. And I, I've I've started to work with the idea of how can I be more just compassionate to them and not um, doing so much getting in the way or getting in the middle of it and let them really live out their own path, their own life, their own experiences and have me be present, be there, not just off doing my own thing and not caring, but be be really with them to help them through it. And I found that that's a place where I'm able to really put on my own oxygen mask mm -hmm. as I'm doing things because I'm not doing so much mental and emotional and physical work to try and help and fix and do that it just depletes and drains me. But yet I'm still feeling really good about being there and being present and being available to hear what it is they might need. And so that's just the difference in, in a mindset or how you might approach it and how you might um, take a different path to what your actions would be after you've recognized someone has a need. Um, like maybe you have a friend in your life that you're thinking that you know is going through a hard time and you're thinking, how can I help them? How can I do something for them that will make them feel better? And it's right there in that little way of thinking that we are taking on something that's not ours taking on a role or a duty or a responsibility to make them feel better when it's not necessarily our job to do that. It's their life. It's their path. It's their uh, experience to have and their, um, their lessons to learn, their, their growth to have. And, and I feel that a way to be putting on my own mask and helping them at the same time is to be someone that's available not judging there for them, but yet not trying to fix it. And so yeah. that's really what my article is about is to just take a new way of how to be helpful, how to be caring, but be compassionate and not overly empathetic.
Yeah, I like that because so many times, don't you think we want to dive in and we think what what is helpful is to like do it. Let me just take in and do everything yeah. for you. And and that doesn't always like like you were saying with children, it doesn't allow them to learn from their own experiences. And because life can be hard. And sometimes with that pain comes the gain. Right. Yeah. And we could be robbing them of the gain part. <laughs> if we just focus on taking away that pain all the time. Yeah, that's what was popping into my mind as you're yeah. talking. I think that's true with kids. Like, I love what you're saying. So um, Amanda and I actually have sons that are similar in age. I think mine's about a year older. And then you have the little one. So I only have one son. And that was um, a big one for me, because I would feel his feelings when he would be in that um, whether it was like a friend who wasn't yeah. being nice or, or bigger mm -hmm. things like that they're facing in their lives. And, you know, I, what I realized partway through and it was about grade 10 was that um, I always wanted to fix everything for him. Like, so he didn't have to suffer. But then it became that realization that like also with allowing them to uh, navigate things themselves, yeah. um, to step back and feel for them. Obviously, you you feel for what they're going through, but letting them navigate it and figure it out for themselves really also builds confidence. Like in terms of looking at a children, and I think that could also apply to like adults you deal with. If, if you're the person in a relationship, um, think even about friendship. Like if you're the one that's always fixing that things for them, mm -hmm. um, what is the dynamic also in that relationship where you're the fixer, right? Like there's certain situations maybe, um, where uh, I'm thinking in the past where I've been the fixer in the relationship and, you know, the dynamic, you know, had to change in that, right? The dynamic had changed. And I'm thinking about, yeah, with um, kids too, like that for me was a real um, learning experience to just let him go through and figure things out on his own. And it was the best thing for him. Yeah. He has so much confidence and, uh, yeah, just the life lessons from that. Oh, year. it so makes sense because there's a message when you're always the fixer. Mm -hmm. That underlying thread is, I don't believe you can do this for yourself. I have to oh. do it. There's yeah. like this, I got chills. this disbelief, yeah. like sending that to a person that you're not competent, you're not capable enough, you haven't learned enough, you haven't learned your lesson. I have to come in and rescue and fix it. And I think there's also a thing in us when we do that, that we, we there's like, you feel good when you're the rescuer it's you, you get this, this yeah. you know it's like it's really it's satisfying to have that and you can kind of get addicted to that so yeah it's a really big like let go of saying wow but you know you'll, you'll probably have a few times where you say oh i kind of knew that wasn't going to work out the way we were using <laughs> that right there's got to be lots of i told you so moments but yeah, yeah for sure as a parent um, yeah, like that's what you want is for them to have confidence that I did this, I fixed yeah. this, I made yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, and I like that you brought up the friendship thing, Shelly, too, because it made me think as well. Um, like if we're always say in the relationship of a friendship, the fixer, there's times when we need their support too, and it makes it harder for us to go into that, hey, I need help kind of mode too, right? And and I can think, you know, of a scenario that I've set myself up that way that I was the fixer. And then when I needed support, it's like, oh yeah, I, I don't feel I can go to that person for support because I didn't allow myself to be in that kind of us to have that kind of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not fair to the other person because in that in that instance or in those situations where you need help, like when they've never had they've never had to do that for you before they don't know your signals for like yeah because it's always been in the reverse so to make it a more yeah open and reciprocal relationship I, I, and yeah as as i never thought about that before but as you were talking it just really clued to me it's like yeah i've been in a relationship with a friend before where i've been the fixer and then you felt i felt like a little bit of um when i needed help and I felt a little bit of resentment when I'm thinking back, like they, I mean, they weren't offering. Yeah. And yeah. then at the point I did come, like, I'm like, well, they probably don't even realize that I need help because also yeah. when you're the fixer, you don't send those signals out. 
Yep, mm -hmm. I had to I had to go through that exact same mm -hmm. thing and, and talk it, it through my own head because yeah, yeah, that resentment was there and it's like, well, Carrie, <laughs> yeah, you set this yeah. up and so what, what am mm -hmm. I doing to yeah, and then just had to make some adjustments there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. And oh, Amanda, I also wanted to mention too because in the Health Shift Project membership. Sai, so you also created a uh, a meditation for compassion. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I um I've done this this meditation a number of times when um and it really helped me to try to get a little bit of that separation because in empathy we take on as if it's our own and in compassion uh, we are able to create a boundary which I think we're going to talk about a little bit more later, creating, creating boundaries, create a boundary between what is ours and what is another's, what is our journey to, to follow and to grapple with and what belongs to other people. And it's just this really respectful and very courageous place where you say in compassion, I'm here with you, but this doesn't belong to me. And the meditation is all about creating a mental image of a container for someone else's uh, suffering. So if there's someone that you're really hurting for, that you think of what they're going through, and it's really causing you a lot of mental anguish, this meditation is great for that because it helps you put some mental imagery around uh, basically putting their them as a person and what they're going through in this container that's separate from yourself. So in the meditation, you imagine almost like this bucket kind of thing where where it's it, it it's existing in your mind, just sort of in front of you. And throughout the meditation, you're you're creating these feelings of compassion, of of love, of gratitude for them as a person, for your relationship for them, and in envisioning and visualizing those things as actual things being poured into the container so that you're you're showing and, and helping yourself understand how you can give the most important things, which are love and understanding and appreciation and forgiveness, maybe sometimes anything. You're just pouring those things into the container and, and and allowing those really powerful things of love and compassion and appreciation to help transform their situation. Not your actions, your interpretations, your doings, all those things. You're letting yourself be separate from what they're going through and yet still present and aware and with them, not ignoring and not caring or anything. Um, and so this meditation helps you get to that feeling of it so that then when you go out in your life and you see them, you're able to just bring up those feelings of love and compassion a whole lot more easy instead of falling into, sometimes it's a trap of you see them or you think of them or you hear of them and then you yourself are lost in sadness and anger and overwhelm. And from that sadness and anger and overwhelm, it's really hard to produce helpful things. But if you can produce within yourself a state of love and compassion and gratitude, then out comes all sorts of really helpful words and support and all of things, all those things. And then I think you really help build the relationship and really truly help the person. Mm, nice, that sounds good. I haven't done done it yet, and uh, but I, I do want to, and, and it sounds like I would benefit from it. Have yeah. you all done the meditation? Just waiting until you have, like, you know, have a really big thing that comes in, like someone else is suffering that pops in, then it's really relevant to use then. Yeah. Oh no, I have something I could use yeah. it on. So right. Most of them do. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys familiar with the? Pono Pono Pono. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. Are you? Sure? No. What's what is it? Hono. Hono Pono Pono. It's a Hawaiian term, and I, I know, know Joe Vitale talks about it a lot, and because it, it's kind of and the, there's meditations around it as well, and I think the three terms are because it's really about compassion and could be compassion for yourself or others. Mm -hmm. And Amanda, is it something like, um, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Oh, there's one other one in there. Can you think of what? Um, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. And then I love, love you. you. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. It's been, I use that all the time. 
And I always go to the please forgive me first. So I go to that when I know I've jumped into too much of an empathetic, assuming too many things about the person or about what they need or about what they're going through that as if I understand, you know, I, I use that place of please forgive me. It's not that I ask the person for that forgiveness. I just ask it kind of to, to the universe kind of out there. Like, like it's a, it's a very um, kind of like sobering and very um, humbling experience to say, wow, I think I've jumped too fast into something and I just want to ask forgiveness to roll it back a little bit and then move into that place of just actually all I want to offer you is love, not assuming and, or, or if I have judged, because sometimes we do that too, like just judge why something happened to someone. Oh, well, you might've done this or this or this, or not, not been good in this area or not been diligent enough in this area. And so something happened to you or, you know, you can get, you can just get messy in your head about trying to understand it and trying to figure it out. And it's just that moment of just saying, whoop, stop. Nope. Just for like, I, I don't want to go there. Like just, yeah. oh, I just, I just want to stop that thinking. And so it's forgiveness for that, that road that you can go down too easily. Not really mm-hmm. that you've done something horribly wrong, but just that you want to stop that, yeah. that path. Right. Nice. Yeah, I've used that uh, Honoponopono meditation for myself a lot. Like I have used it for others too, but I've said it because I'm really hard on myself. Um, My inner critic is very chatty sometimes and I'm really hard on myself. So I often use that for myself and telling myself like, please forgive me and I love you. Like, (laughs) so it's like my two inner selves talking to each other that's how i've used it yeah so but um okay so we've talked about supporting children we've talked about supporting ourselves we've talked about uh supporting friends um shelly i know you're in an experience where you are supporting aging parents and i know a lot of other people out there are in that situation right now as well and i would love for you to dive into that and and share some of what you're going through and and the wisdom of what you've learned through the process well, yeah, continually learning. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm totally sandwich generation. So I have a 16 year old and then I have my parents and um, we, you know, you try to prepare yourself really for what that looks like. We always had the plan that my parents would eventually move in with us um, down, the lo- down the road. My dad actually has a condition called um, normal pressure hydrocephalus. And it's basically a water, water on the brain. He had a fall. They think they're not actually sure um, where it why he it happened to him um so he had a shunt surgery done about seven years ago and it really gave us our dad back for a while like he um he had basically when when he had the surgery he was basically nonverbal and couldn't walk and it came on very quickly so we always kind of have been um making this plan that they would be with us um just to help support um support him as 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 the illness progressed because it was a fix so he basically had that surgery he was able to walk again he um was verbal again and so we basically got our dad somewhat back like after that so it was a beautiful story that's a beautiful story but we also it gave us the time to make a plan but even when you have plans nothing really um can prepare you for what it looks like when you're actually in it amanda i'm thinking of you and homeschooling this year yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah. The best um, plans. Yeah. 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 So then one thing I really um tried to tell myself before, and we 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 planned this as they came in was boundaries, setting boundaries. And we did it in a lot of different ways. Like the way we did our renovation was um creating space like for everyone. So in that way, creating space for people. And that is emotional, intellectual, and actually the physical space of where we are was important. So we made enough space so everyone had a place to go. Thinking about a 16-year-old, what does that look for? like for a 16-year-old to have his grandparents move in with him? So we made him a space where he could have friends over, have his own space. So we did we did those things. So um, 
and and anyone who's going through this, think about that. Think about the physical space and what that's going to look like, because that's one thing we did. But when we're here, the idea of making space for myself now and making space for each of us individually. And that's been key. And that's about setting boundaries too for myself. And that has been a big thing because my dad has short term memory issues. So he will not remember he's asked me something or because he can't remember um, what he needs to do. He needs a lot of structure in his life. So if anything goes off in that, like it's, um, it can become a big thing. So one thing I was uh, telling you ladies (laughs) was about the uh, shovel. So he really (laughs) wants a snow shovel out of the shed. And I've been really busy the last few weeks and he keeps mentioning the snow shovel. And I just have to take a breath and be like, you know what, I can't, like I'll explain every time, I can't, I can't do the snow shovel right now because I have these other things to do. And to get in, and like, it's a process to get the snow shovel out, okay? Like I have to get to the garage and get it. And there's no snow right now, so it's not a priority. So I will explain that to him, but I have to explain it to him every morning, basically, oh, why yeah. we're not getting the snow shovel out. Um, or if he doesn't have bananas for his cereal, like that can be for us um, a bigger issue. Not like when you're dealing with kids where it's a temper tantrum. It's not that, obviously. Like yeah. he's very, my dad's very like laid back, but there's that feeling of guilt that I can't do those things for him where I have thrown his life off by not having everything lined up. And I just can't. I'm not, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm not going to buy enough bananas some weeks for groceries. I'm going to forget to get his berries out of the freezer and put them in the container. Like I'm going to make mistakes. And for me, it's like creating space for myself to just be like, yep, I didn't do that. And that's okay. So that's, that's a big one um, to kind of create those. So not just the boundaries of like, um, what I will and will not do, but um, the space, and I, I call it a boundary for myself, because it's like, I feel an internal boundary, like I'm not going to take on the guilt of that, or I'm not going to take on feeling disappointed, I didn't get enough bananas, or that I didn't, go get that snow shovel, even though I know I'm going to be asked about it tomorrow. So it's um, kind of setting that personal boundary up for myself that I'm not going to internalize it. I'm not going to take that into myself and and feel any of those feelings that it could, that could come up. So that has been um, a big one for me. And can I, um, sorry, could I interrupt for a second? Because I'm curious, like, what are the kinds of things you do to help you do that? Like to help stay true to Okay, you said you said I'm going to set this boundary of not internalizing it. Yeah, yeah. how do you do that? Or- okay, well, one first of all, it's not perfect because some days I do feel bad. Like that's the truth. Some days yeah. I do for a minute. Like so, I'm gonna like in that minute when I realize I didn't get enough bananas as an example, or yeah, like I'll be like, darn, like you know, I'll feel bad. Like I'll be like, oh, but then you know, I it's a conversation. It's like. Mm-hmm deep breath. No, I, so really a lot of deep breaths, but also mm-hmm. it does become a little bit of an intellectual exercise in saying, don't take that on Shelly. Like the conversation, don't take that on Shelly. You're doing the best you can. And then to take space, like physical space to just go away for a minute and be like regroup. So then what do I do in that time when I create that space for myself? What do I do? So, um, forgive me. I'm a yoga teacher. I'm going to be a little woo woo. So yeah. there we go. But Yay, love woo. Um, yeah. <laughs> But I always think of woo-woo is actually like mindfulness, you know, like, so I talk about um, things I do for myself uh, in my space. Um, one, I'll just sit on my, my mat with my meditation card, pull one out, a mindfulness card, and just be like, focus on that, um, what that message says to me. Um, I use stones and, and essential oils, those type of things that kind of just take you into that space of self-care. So essential oils it's just even if I do uh, abayanga which is like a massage on my joints it's just I take a moment in that space to just be like just care for yourself for a moment and and it's that analogy Amanda said like put the oxygen mask on first I do self-care things and it can be something silly like or little like I will massage my hands because I also draw so I get achy hands just take 30 seconds massage your hands that's one thing I do for myself it's just that little piece of self-care in doing that, in doing something even so small is a really powerful belief that you have going on there. Like you really believe in the power of 
setting that that um, that boundary and setting yeah. that making it a priority to do something for yourself. And I think you're saying like you believe that your actions and your words towards your dad afterwards, after you do that self care thing, are going to be more beneficial for your relationship. Are going to be more beneficial for him. All of that things. If you just take that step back reset regroup and then then move forward and and then do it so there's a really like really powerful thing in a small thing but you know it's actually something i've actually learned from doing too because when i take that um step to just take a moment of whatever it is go smell an essential oil <laughs> yeah. go with my hands it's um it does allow me when I go back in then I have more energy. It's that oxygen mask on. It's like, I feel more loving to go back in. If yeah. I don't do it, then my window of tolerance, which you talk about often is lower. And then I'm going to like snap when he asked me to go get the, the broom or, or the, or the shovel. The shovel yeah. And yeah. And that quote that I I've shared with you guys before, but that boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. And then when I do that, when I take that moment, um, or that time just I even can just walk in the hall to be honest away from out of the room and do something a little bit and then I can come back in and be like no because what happens when you don't do that what happens when I don't uh replenish myself or I don't uh fill the well I call it in yoga class often you fill your well mm -hmm. to go back in then you have guilt because you snap at them or um and I even with my son too, it's like, cause it's something can happen with my dad that I then have to then deal with something with my son, like two minutes later. And if I don't take the time in between those things to fill my well, then, um, then my reactions and my interactions just leave me more depleted. So it is so vital, vital to like, I mean, we talk about it and people like self care seems like this big, um, indulgence indulgence it, yeah it's mm. absolutely not an indulgence it's how you can have healthy and functional relationships even mm. when you're dealing with young children even when you're dealing with um you know the parents who are going to eventually we're all going to be their age uh you know it happens to all of us mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and, and think about those mm -hmm. think about that depletion like you're talking about your each individual instance or conversation or situation that you're having day to day but yeah. you can pile those up over five years ten years and what mm -hmm. is your body left with to be mm -hmm. able to maintain health yeah. that is like the the window where chronic disease sets in and is fueled yeah. in there is when your body is depleted and your energy is gone for, for these other things. So if you don't replete and don't put your oxygen mask on, there really is a big detrimental effect to you in the long run and your overall yeah. health. And, and you know, and I've been there. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know what I love that we're identifying here too is that like life still happens to us. And even, you know, for people who are gurus, you know, spiritual teachers and the things like that, like, everybody's still human and mm -hmm. those situations come up like that situation you know you shared with the shovel and you probably like oh in the moment you know it sets you off like we all hit those moments and so we mm -hmm. all have those feelings of Ugh. and then it's great to know what are those self-care tools that work for us that I yeah. can then go tap into, which is why I want to ask, hey gosh, Kelly, what are some of yours? And because it, it makes work an idea of, oh yeah, that might be something that might work for me that I could try. Yeah. I got to the oh, sorry, it's such a silly thing to think that the pinnacle of like arriving at being really emotionally mature and spiritually developed is that you never feel sadness and anger and frustration again. Like that's like, I don't know how, or I think that's just naturally thought of like, oh, when I arrive, I'll just never feel <laughs> this again. I'm just going to sit in this beautiful, you know, space of being loving all the time. I think it's much more that when you experience them, because you always will if you're still living a life and interaction with people when you experience it you just know exactly what to do to settle it down you just don't let it take hold and light a huge out out of control fire within you you just recognize it and you're able to just pull back and reset it really fast yeah
I love that reset word. I've been I, yeah. um, pushing that reset button a lot lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, because everyone has a fresh start. Every day is a new opportunity to just start fresh. And actually, even in those times, like, so I'm no angel. Like, yes, I have actually been short with my dad. Absolutely. But then it's that reset. It's like, so it's a moment I do it. And then I have learned, and this is something I've learned through being in those really low spots. And then how I've learned to come out of it. It's like, I love, yeah, the reset. It's like in a minute in a second, I can reset. And then my next line out of my mouth is then something that's kind, or something that is patient. Um, But yeah, it's a reset in every second, every opportunity, every minute is an opportunity to like do that reset. I love that word too, Carrie. (laughs) Yeah. And you know what I find for me too, uh, Mm -hmm. because you know, I've experienced the the blow up, you know, uh, do maybe too many times as my husband will I'm sure (laughs) (laughs) that now I can recognize the symptoms of when I'm getting to that point and I can catch it before I hit the wall you know and 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 about to, to blow it's like oh I recognize I'm heading down that path now and if I don't put on my oxygen mask I'm the 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 volcano is going to erupt. So, and that's what me doing that self care that uh, all that, you know, self help work has done for me is to help me identify before it gets to the volcano eruption. (laughs) So what do you do? So like, what are things that are for you, those pieces that the, the tools in your toolbox, like what do you do when you need to do the reset or when you need to, you realize that it's getting overwhelming. The overwhelming. I have so many (laughs) tools in my toolbox that I use and I think it it differs on the day and the situation. Mm -hmm. Definitely deep breathing. (laughs) Um, EFT tapping, which I shared last month. That's, that's a big one for me. Um, Just kind of turning off the world for a moment. And one of my favorite ways to do that is to go on a dog walk and mm-hmm. I'll kind of put on like a, a my headphones and I'll put on a book so that I can just try to concentrate on just that one thing or or nothing and just like do a meditative walk and be in nature. So dog walks are probably my number one thing that I use, yoga for sure, <laughs> meditation, hot baths. Yeah, those are some of the tools in my toolbox. Yeah. Speaking of yoga, Shelly, what would you say are some of the best either poses or sequences that that you would recommend or use uh, when people find themselves in that just state of overwhelm and yeah. kind of so, quick things like for yeah. me, like if I don't have time to do a whole thing, what are some? So when you're in overwhelm and like that, that cortisol production, like grounding. So what does grounding mean? Grounding just is actually slowing the body down in, in any way you can. And the best way to do that is actually to sit on the ground, Mm. to connect, to go down um, to the ground, connect either hands on the ground, your sits bones, your, your um, two bones at those bony protrusions, sitting those on the ground, connecting um, and to slow down, starting to take slower, deep breaths that just activates that parasympathetic nervous system. So grounding practices. So what that would look in a sequence of yoga, would be um, Sukhasana, which is seated easy pose, just cross-legged or legs in front with palms up, or you can focus with your, if you can see me here with your hands on your belly and just start to follow the breath in and out. It's just an observation. Following that breath takes you right into breath as the anchor in mindfulness. Um, And then from there, just any type of forward fold. Forward folds are just such a grounding um movements so if, if you're seated that can just be like tucking the chin in letting your body your upper body fold over your lower body so seated forward fold or if you're standing too you can do a forward fold um just again the upper body folds over anytime you're letting your upper body fold over it's just such a grounding movement so as opposed to even knowing any yoga names or anything just yeah just that fold over yeah and it just takes you like bend down and tie your shoes if you're in a really awkward spot. <laughs> just, like, <laughs> or sitting in your chair at work. You just yeah. like you oh. let your let yourself create the space for your belly, let yourself fold forward. Um, 
And one, it's a reset. Like we're talking, okay. it's a reset. You're looking at the world a little bit differently. And it's just a really um, slowing pace. And it allows you to um, find a little bit of introspection as well so mm-hmm. that you can um, move out of the conversation you're having in your head that probably maybe isn't healthy or is, you know, the, the conversation the of battle. guilt. Yeah. Yeah. And just one, the, I always call breath the anchor. So the anchor to um, pull you back into yourself. And yeah. the other one I like to think about in terms of breathing. So a cue for breathing is I talk about breathing into your solar plexus. So your solar plexus is that place between your heart and your navel, and it's your center of personal power. So taking the breath there, it'll also start to make you feel just a little bit more um, in control of, mm-hmm. of what's going on in your life and in control of your reactions, in control of the words that come out of your mouth. Um, so take it down a notch, find a little bit of, of grounding and then using that breath as the anchor to slow you down. Yeah. Nice. And I noticed too, Shelly, mm-hmm. that you um, and the membership site offered mm-hmm. a solar plexus yoga. And you yeah. were just mentioning the solar plexus. And, and so I, yeah. I, I just noticed mm-hmm. it this morning that you're offering that. And it's like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to go in and do that. It's a nice one also for November. So the solar plexus, like I had mentioned, yeah, the, per, the person power. But when you build that heat, especially in November when it's so windy out and, and often gray, so cold, we're not used to our cold. We haven't adapted to the cold. Creating that heat at your center also just gives you a little bit of um, calming energy. So it's not like, um, it's not a practice to kind of get you all hyper, let's go out and, and get the world, but just finding a little bit of of warmth with within to kind of, get you going in the day so it's a nice balance in practice too yeah nice. yeah that that one would seem really good because i think for me sometimes when i hit that that overwhelm i start to check out a little bit i move into that that freeze response of just leave me alone let me go off on my own and it, it my energy actually goes way down so i feel like i need something to bring me back up warm me up mm-hmm. get like make me feel okay with movement and and I often will just start moving about my house even just really slowly, like time to go for just a gentle, really, really gentle walk and try to get that that motivation because it's kind of like I go to the spot of nothing, don't want anything, just want to check out, leave me be. And so mm-hmm. I need something to bring it back up. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Common common thing yeah yeah. well that was a wonderful conversation ladies thank you so much and thanks for listening everybody uh one thing that we are going to be launching very soon as we are talking about hitting that reset button we are going to be offering a three-day stress reset that we put together and uh it could be perfect for yourself or as a gift so in the next uh week watch watch your um inbox watch our social media posts for more information on that uh might be something that could really help you help to put on that oxygen mask for you and of course we have you know some of the support that we already talked about in the membership group and there's there's more to come as well uh but there's also some already really great resources in there So we would hope that you would join us uh, and be a part of our membership community at thehealthshiftproject.com. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.